Before we begin, it's time for the fine print. You know, you got a big document and then there's the fine print. This discussion that we're going to have contains blatant, unabashed plagiarism. Many of the thoughts presented today stem from an Oklahoma camp meeting sermon a number of years ago by a writer and traveling speaker for the Voice of Prophecy by the name of John McClarty. Any of you? Okay. When is this? 30 years ago? <laughs> anyway, let's bow our heads before we begin. Heavenly Father, again we ask that you would send your spirit to be with us. I particularly ask that you would be with me as I present this, that your spirit would be with my words, but I pray that your spirit would be with everyone who is listening. I believe that there's not only the gift of speech, but there is the gift of hearing. As we know in Acts, everyone heard in their own language. And I pray that you would provide for each person here or listening the message that they need to hear today. We pray and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, in Matthew 13, 34, it states that Jesus spoke in parables, and without a parable spake he not unto them. Basically, he used illustrations from nature and a life experience to, to bring out spiritual truths. Over and over again, Christ would begin with, the kingdom of heaven is like. This morning... I would like to imitate his method, but of course my example is not nearly as profound or as deep as his. The kingdom of heaven is like an adventure in the Boundary Waters Wilderness Park. A little over 30 years ago, yeah it was that long ago, 1993 to be exact, I came across an article in, we got this magazine from the insurance company and it would have things to keep your house safe, but it would also have other interesting articles in it. And it talked about a father and son who had gone on a canoeing expedition for vacation and had had a wonderful time. I mentioned it to Joy as a vacation idea. A short time later, Joy was talking with the Beldons at that time. Uh, Mr. Belden, Jim Belden, was the teacher at the Claremore School. Carolyn probably remembers that. Um, and they mentioned that they were, that summer, they were going to go canoeing for a vacation. When Joy got home, she said, why don't you call up Jim? Get some ideas, get the details. It sounds like something you were talking about. So I called up Jim and said, tell me about this canoeing trip you're going on. Quite frankly, he was not very enthused. Yeah, we're going with my wife's cousin and family. <coughs> Excuse me. I don't even know who they are. And I understand that with some family relations. Um, we're going to the Boundary Waters Canoe Area in Minnesota. You have to pack everything for a week. You canoe through all these rivers and lakes and camp in a tent on the ground. I'm not sure why we're even going. Then he said, Say, why don't you guys join us? At least there would be someone on the trip I know. So that got the ball rolling. This was well before we had made any acquaintance with Dr. Google. Remember, this is 30 years ago. So we started by pulling out the atlas and discovered it was in the northeast corner of Minnesota along the Canadian boundary, hence the boundary waters. Through a number of phone calls and reading, we learned a number of things. Within the boundaries of the Wilderness Park, There are literally hundreds of lakes connected by streams and rivers 
with little campsites all along the area. You can't have any motorized craft ex with a few exceptions. You cannot have more than nine people in your group or more than four canoes in your group. You can only camp in designated campsites and the campsites are represented by all those little triangles. The campsite has to have a fire grate and a latrine. You cannot take anything in in glass containers. You cannot burn plastics. You cannot use a chainsaw to cut firewood. You cannot cut any standing wood. You cannot leave any trash in the park. You cannot use portage wheels, and we'll revisit that. Oh, and you cannot enter without a permit. The permit is day specific and entry point specific. If it's raining, cats and dogs, doesn't matter. And I can attest to that because we entered it twice while it was raining cats and dogs. It doesn't matter. If you, enter on, if you don't enter on that day, you can't enter the next day even if you have a two-week permit and so on. But we decided we were up for the adventure. We got a food dehydrator, or we already had one, I forget which, and dried a lot of different fruits and veggies. We s reserved a permit. We put a food list together for five days on the water. We collected sleeping bags, tents, rain ponchos, matches, duffel bags, sealable five-gallon buckets, loaded it all in the van, and took off. The morning we actually launched, we loaded the canoes to the brim. And we followed the lead of this cousin that we didn't know, who was an old timer at it. Kathalie was seven, Edwin was nine. So Joy and I mostly towed them in their canoe behind our canoe. So we were always tailing Charlie. Some areas were so swift they were, they were too swift to canoe, so we pulled the canoes up by what's called lining, sometimes through swift water up to our waist or higher. And other times we just had to unload the canoes and portage or carry the canoes, as mentioned earlier. There are such things as portage wheels, which are little wheeled carts. You put your canoe on, and pull them over the trails, but they're not allowed in the Boundary Waters Park. And I must admit that first day was a trial. At the end of the day, we had traveled about 11 miles and our arms felt like rubber and the next day we could hardly move. But the scenery was unbeatable and after a brief recovery we began to explore. There were beaver and loons. The loons were calling and laughing day, uh, mostly in the night, it seemed. Um, and the loon became to Kathalie what the squirrel is to Ruth. There were wild blueberries to be picked. We saw foxes and we saw eagle. moose, and often the water was so clear you could see the fish swimming on the bottom, many feet deep. Though we didn't see any bear, we did see substantial evidence that they were around. We followed some of their trails, probably quite unwisely, but we did scavenge some other people's camping gear that were back in the bushes. But having experienced the boundaries waters, we said we have to do it again, and we have. In fact, we've been to the boundary waters as a family with other people joining us at times, four times. And if you were to ask Edwin or Kathalie their favorite vacations, family vacations, they would probably say the boundary waters. There's Kathalie there. Boundary waters is good, huh? She says yes. 
Every time we w went, we had new experiences and enjoyed it more. I would love to go on, but I'm not sure at this point I'm prepared to flip a 70-pound canoe up on my head and hike a half a mile with it. I can send you a full reading list on the Boundary Waters. I can send all sorts of literature to your door and links on the internet. And I can kind of see on your face as you're saying, you know, Bryant, that's really nice. But we came for a sermon today, not a travelogue. I'm glad you and your family enjoyed it, to which I must reply, come go with me. You will never understand until you have experienced it. Then you will forever be hooked on it too. You see, it's like this. The Sabbath is a lot like an expedition to the Boundary Waters Wilderness Park. No matter how much you read about the Sabbath, no matter how much you talk and philosophize about the Sabbath, you will never really understand and appreciate the wonder and excitement of the Sabbath unless you directly experience the Sabbath yourself. But there are many other parallels between the Boundary Waters Wilderness and the Sabbath. So we're going to explore the parallels and perhaps see the Sabbath in a new light from a different angle. First of all, the Boundary Waters. The Boundary Waters Park has a geographical place. We can see it on the map. And did you know what? The Sabbath has a real place in time. It is, has a location on the calendar, the seventh day. It was established in Eden at the end of creation. So I'd like you to take your Bibles and let's do a little more exploring, okay? I want you to go to Genesis 2, 2 and 3. Again, that's Genesis 2, verses 2 and 3. Still hearing a few pages rustling. That's a good sound, you know that? It doesn't give you the same sound when you find it on your phone. Now, I have nothing against finding it on your phone. It says, and, the seventh, and on the seventh day God ended his, his work which he had made and, rest, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. Of course, this is reinforced in the middle of the fourth commandment, Exodus 20, verse 10. I mean, you know, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, and you go on down to verse 10. It says, But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. Sounds like work's not really something you're supposed to do, right? So it has a place. It's defined. It has a place on the calendar, Boundary Waters has a place on the map. But then we talk about the Boundary Waters Park. So what is a park? In the purest sense, it's not a park, a place to rest. As a verb, when I park the car, what am I doing? Am I not resting my poor, dilapidated car? What is a park bench for? 
we have one out here at the entrance to the church. It is so we can park ourselves or rest ourselves, right? So just as the Boundary Waters Wilderness Park is a geographical place for mental and physical rest, can we not call the Sabbath a park in time for physical, mental, and spiritual rest and renewal? As we noted earlier, the Boundary Waters Park has very specific boundaries that are a line of demarcation between everyday activities, such as motorboating, etc. So we find in the Bible not only the place in time for the Sabbath park, but it is defined, but the boundaries or borders of the Sabbath park are defined as well. Although Genesis 1 in the account all through Genesis 1 in the account of creation week, it says the evening and the morning were the first day, the second day, up through the sixth day when God says, he looked at all creation and said, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Thus, dividing the days was established at creation and the principle is reiterated in Leviticus 23.32. Okay, Leviticus 23.32. Says, From even unto even shall ye celebrate your Sabbath. Now, in reality, this is in connection with other uh, religious holidays with the demarcation. There were other ceremonial Sabbaths as opposed to the weekly Sabbath. But the principle is the same from even until evening. Just as creation, it was evening and morning. And it, it's very interesting that both the Boundary Waters Wilderness Park and the Sabbath, or our park in time, are predominantly defined negatively, as in a list of can't do's, okay? You see, you would never be able to list all the things you can do. It's much more feasible and efficient when listening to only list the restrictions. As noted above, there are a whole lot of things you can't do in the Boundary Waters. And as a result, the lakes, rivers, and streams are clean and beautiful. So LaRue's not here today, is he? I'd like to put in a word for LaRue. After you have paddled and portaged for five hours, and it's hot, it's in the mid-80s, wouldn't it be nice to round the bend and find LaRue's snow cone stand? Wouldn't that be great? You can go pull up to the bank and get a nice snow cone. That'd be great, wouldn't it? And if it's raining and you forgot to bring a rain poncho, wouldn't it be nice Put to pull up to the docks in front of Walmart and run in and get a poncho to protect yourself from the rain. You know, and after you've been on the waters for five days and you've slept on the ground with that big rock in your back, wouldn't it be nice to have a bed and breakfast on the banks? go. There we go. And pretty soon, what's happened to our boundary waters? Are they the boundary waters anymore? 
Pretty soon all the rivers and lakes are lined with commercial enterprises and the Boundary Waters looks like Branson. But no, thanks to the can'ts and don'ts, the Boundary Waters Wilderness Park remains a predominantly pristine park. The with the natural scenery and wildlife are still in abundance there. Note, the things excluded are not generally bad things, okay? But these good things are excluded to make room for something better. However, as soon as we allow LaRue with his snow cone stand, as desirable as it may sound, the other commercialization will soon follow. Once the can'ts and don'ts and other exclusions and requirements are removed, the Boundary Waters Wilderness Park ceases to be a park. Oops, anyway, it jumped back quick, okay. But anyway, you get the idea. As soon as all of these things, if, if we restrict those, if we remove those restrictions, pretty soon the Boundary Waters Park is no longer a park. And the same is true of the Sabbath, the park and time. Let's look at the fourth commandment. So let's go to Exodus 20, verses 8 to 11. We, we were in the middle of it earlier. Exodus 20, 8 to 11. Many of you probably have it memorized. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God, in it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, thy stranger that is within thy gates. Does that kind of give a comprehensive list there? For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is and rested the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Notice how it is negatively stated. Don't work. Not myself. I can't have the kids do the work for me. I can't hire someone to work. I can't put my animals to work. Don't, can't, thou shalt not. And in other places we find a little more elaboration on these few prohibitions. In Nehemiah, 10, I won't go through the whole thing here, in Nehemiah 10, 31, and 13, 15, and 16, we find the people being corrected for buying and selling, that would be commercial activities, on the Sabbath. Kind of sounds like the Boundary Waters Park, doesn't it? They were also found harvesting their crops on Sabbath, all forms of work, and you can You'll also see that in Isaiah 58, 12 to 14. Note, the commandment actually commands us to work, to labor, right? So the restrictions are not restricting bad things, but are simply removing them from the park to make room for something better. Sometimes we are tempted to say, wouldn't it be a whole lot less work and a whole lot more restful to just go out to eat this Friday evening during Sabbath time? Not only is this buying and selling, but, and commercial, which is commercialization, but it also requires your servants, as in the cooks and waiters, to work for you. Or we say, I'm almost done with the yard work. I'll finish just a little after sundown. Or, or, or. We have a way of rationalizing everything we want, don't we? 
You see, just as the Boundary Waters Wilderness Park, as soon as we start hedging, as soon as we remove the exclusions, as soon as we remove the boundaries, it's no longer a park. The Sabbath ceases to be a park in time. Pretty soon, it will look just like any other day of the week. So, let's look at the Sabbath purpose. In, in recent times, there has been a lot of emphasis on physical and mental rest aspects of the Sabbath, and rightly so. We even find non-Seventh-day Adventists extolling the virtues of a Sabbath day of rest, also promoting that what is rest for you may not be rest for me. Uh, and rest primarily represents a change of pace, okay? Some people, you know, they work in the office all day. Maybe someone like Brad has a garden out back, and it's very relaxing to Brad to go play with his tomato plants. Yeah? Okay. We're on the same page, right? Okay. Therefore, promoting that if you work behind a desk, that rest for you might include doing good, like building a house for a weekend with Habitat for Humanity. Good work indeed. Habitat for Humanity does a lot of good things, don't they? Yeah. Or just no matter what your job is, a weekend of water skiing is an amazing restful change of pace. Great philosophy, right? There's just one problem. This ignores the primary reason for the Sabbath. The park in time has an additional stated purpose beyond that of the Boundary Waters Wilderness Park. We find this main purpose stated in Genesis, the first Sabbath, which we've already looked at, but we're going to look at it again. At the giving of the fourth commandment and in the first angel's message in Revelation. If we go to Genesis 2 verse 3, it says, And God blessed the seventh day. Okay, that's nice. He sanctified it. What, what does this sanctify thing mean? It means it's not only a day of rest, but he made it a holy time. Because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. He sanctified the time. He made it holy. And again at the end of the fourth commandment. Again, we've looked at it earlier, but we're going to look at it again. Exodus 20 verse 11. The very final verse of the fourth commandment says, For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Sanctified and hallowed are pretty much synonymous. He made it holy. So, Here we see that to remember who is our creator is a time, may I say a park, is set aside, it is blessed, it is hallowed or made holy. In the first angel's message of revelation, clearly an allusion to the Sabbath of creation and the fourth commandment, we find the requirements even more clearly stated. And this is Revelation 14, 6 and 7. Again, Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7. I'm still hearing pages. I'll give you time. Okay, Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, 
into every nation and kindred and tongue and people. Okay? Something about this, the everlasting gospel would mean it would be way back there and ever going, I guess I'm backwards hand directions for you guys. It's, it's both directions. It's an everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and says every nation and kindred and tongue and people, that's pretty much everybody, right? So there's an everlasting gospel for everybody and how do, do they summarize it? Same with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth the sea and the fountains of water. So part of the everlasting gospel is worshiping the creator. And that creator set aside a day at the end of creation. And it's mentioned again in the fourth commandment. And actually it's mentioned multiple places through the Bible. You see, God intentionally set aside a park in time not only as a time of rest, but as a holy time and blessed time, a time to worship the creator God, a time when he can commune with us. This is a time God has set aside to allow his created beings a time of special communion with him. We read in Mark 2.27, Mark 2, verse 27. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. This is a special gift that God has given to us. It's a time to contemplate his works and commune with him, the creator of the universe. So you see, a day of water skiing is great. How many of you, you don't do, you do wakeboard stuff now. You don't do water skiing, okay? But for some of us who have rock water skis, water skiing's fun. And so a day of water skiing is good. Helping build a house for the poor is even better. But on the Sabbath day, the park in time, these activ activities steal our attentions away from the purpose of the park. You see, and I'll be honest with you, if I were on water skis today, would I be contemplating God's creation? I'd be watching where the wake was, what my angle to the wake was, how high I was going to, or how hard I was going to jump, would I make it across the other wake? Enjoyable. But it doesn't meet the purpose of the Sabbath. Does that make sense? Okay. If we go to Psalms 46, verse 10. Psalms 46, verse 10. says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. This is a time. This is the purpose of the park in time. It is also significant to note that in Exodus 20, we don't read, it is suggested and recommended that you do not work on the Sabbath. And it is suggested that you not require your kids or servants to work either. My kids would have loved that. Yeah. We used to call them, what did we call you guys? The slaves. Yes. Okay. Um, 
Nehemiah did not say, it is suggested that you do not do business in the streets of Jerusalem on the Sabbath. Just as the prohibitions in the Boundary Waters Park are regulations, not suggestions. And I have a tie here. If the fourth commandment were merely a suggestion, how many of us would likely actually observe it today for a full 24 hours? You see, I am almost never ready for the Sabbath. You say, well, well you're a Seventh-day Adventist and you're making that statement? And don't take me wrong. But I never accomplish all I set out to do in a week. There is always more to be done. There are deadlines that should have been met. Now, I know this doesn't apply today, but the yard is yet to be mowed, etc. If God had said it is suggested, most of us, most of us here are workaholics. And we would be much like the world showing up to church for a couple of hours, a couple of times a month, and that would be our limit of Sabbath keeping. But I am very thankful that God has said, I have created a park in time for you because I want to meet with you. What a privilege to meet with God, with the God of the universe, in his park. Let's not spurn the opportunity. And I, I would like to also say, when we, when, when we keep the Sabbath, we are not keeping the Sabbath so that we will be saved. It's because we have a Savior and we want to spend time with Him. Yes, it is in the, it is in the Ten Commandments. When we first decided to go on the expedition to the Boundary Waters Park, we made a lot of preparations. We prepared appropriate food for the trip. We gathered gear, gear for rain, for hot, for cold, for emergencies. We made travel preparations to the entry point, etc. Similarly, we need to make preparations ahead of time for the Sabbath park in time. In fact, in Christ's day, Friday was known as a preparation day. We find that in uh, the last chapters of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And they say, and it was at the end of the preparation day. But I think, in reality, the concept of preparation for the Sabbath goes way back further. In fact, probably further beyond what I'm mentioning here. When the children of Israel left Egypt and were given manna in the wilderness... They were commanded to gather twice as much manna on Friday and prepare it for the Sabbath. So the principle is this, so far as possible, do all labor and menial tasks ahead of time so that when we enter the boundaries of the park in time, we are ready to focus our attention to communing with our Lord, the creator of the universe. Let us not be as Martha fussing over the meals and arrangements and other details when we can be sitting at Jesus' feet. Another thing, when we embarked on the boundary to the Boundary Waters adventure, you may have noticed we departed as a group. In so doing, we were able to build on each other's courage and the experience of our group leader. And as the saying goes, there's strength in numbers, which in the, in the wild wilderness can be quite significant. In a group, we were less likely to actually have encounters with bears or wolves. If someone were to, to be injured, there would be enough people for some to stay with the injured and some to go for help. And so it is, now I will say this, the first time we went out there, there wasn't, well, I won't say there wasn't any, but generally speaking, no one had cell phones. 
And so if you were injured, you had to dispatch someone to go to an entry point to find a phone and call. Last time we were out there, we had cell service in some places. But anyway, you would have some, you would have enough people to stay with a person and help them and some to go for help. And so it is as we travel through this wilderness of sin. There are many dangers, but we can gain strength and courage from our brothers and sisters in Christ. Now I know some of you have had this as a memory verse, but I'd like us to look it up. Hebrews 10 verse 25. Hebrews 10 verse 25. Forsaking not the assembly of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much more as ye see the day approaching. Now the day approaching here is the day of Christ's coming. But there is strength and encouragement among brethren. And it is a, it's a good thing. Now, we each need to be able to stand on our own, I understand that. But there is camaraderie among among us as we travel this road. Proverbs 27, 17. Proverbs 27, 17. It says, Iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. Just as you, back then I guess I didn't have the fancy grinding stones that we have today. But you would sharpen your sword with another sword, I guess. I've never done it, okay? My sword's pretty dull. But, um, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. So what better time to strengthen and encourage our fellow believers than on the Sabbath day? Now, the first time we went, or as our family embarked on the adventure in the Boundary Waters Wilderness Park, I admit that that first day was a struggle. There were several reasons for that. Our group, as in our family, our team had the youngest members. As it turned out, for pilotage, and navigation reasons, Joy and I wound up towing the kids. Those are supposed to be canoes, by the way. As they were dodging enemy fire or something, they were weaving erratically. They would go from one side to the other side, and we just kept headed in the one direction, and we just said, just paddle, just paddle. And so it was kind of a interesting trip. And thus it was that we were always Taylor and Charlie. And the group would wait and rest till we caught up. Then what do you think they did? They took off. And so we had to take off immediately as well. And there's some lessons in that for helping our brethren. So we were never able to catch our breath. At portages, basically Joy and I each had a canoe to handle by ourselves rather than having two people to handle each canoe as the other teams had. And I didn't even have a map. We were to follow the group leader, but he was leaving us way behind. I worried. If we got separated, if I inadvertently made a wrong turn because I didn't see which way they went, would we ever be able to find our way back out of the maze of lakes and streams and portages, particularly without a map? So it was a real struggle that first trip. 
there is a museum there made from a cabin of the last resident from the Boundary Waters area. It is the cabin of Dorothy, who was known as the Root Beer Lady. On the wall of her cabin was this sign, and some of you have seen it before. So you just keep your mouth shut, okay? Some Indian word up there. Can you see it? Figure it out? Brad's seen it before. Which became the motto of all the Boy Scout troops that passed by her place as well, as us. Quit your belly aching. Okay? We are continually asking the Holy Spirit to put us in contact with those who are seeking truth. As truth seekers come to us, they will be introduced to many concepts, especially the concept of the importance of the Sabbath. During, you know, whatever studies, we are very good at providing the, um, the evidence in the Bible, the importance of the Sabbath, what day the Sabbath is, when it starts. But to, all too often, there is very little time to discuss the how of the Sabbath. Some years ago, Joy and I were socializing with a couple who were attending church. And they confessed they were really struggling with the concepts and application of the principles of the Sabbath. And I fear that all too often those of us who have been acquainted with the Sabbath for many years, some of us for all of our lives, perhaps we do not understand the struggles of newcomers to the Sabbath. We appear to easily flip a canoe over our heads and trot down the trail while they drag theirs along the path, so to speak, and we unconsciously signal to them, quit your belly aching, keep after it, you'll get the hang of it. And soon they become discouraged and come to the conclusion that the park and time is not for them. We must each plan what we can do to reduce the struggles of people who are new to this truth. Perhaps in a one-on-one -on -one basis, we can invite them to join us as in our homes we enter the Sabbath or the park in time. And the other thing is, is we will only truly get to know people in our homes. Or ask them to join us other ways as we contemplate the goodness of our Creator and commune with Him. And I'm reminded, I mean, yes, there are the don't work, don't do this, don't do that, and so forth. How many of you are familiar with the Little House on the Prairie? Not the TV series, the books. Little House on the Prairie. And in the book Farmer Boy, you have Almanzo. That's not our Alfonso, it's Almanzo, okay? And there's a story in there. Apparently, they approached Sunday keeping in a very rigid manner. And the young boys were made to sit quietly all day long. And they noticed their dad was asleep and they exited the scene and found the snow sled and they got caught just as they came down the hill. There was a pig in the road and they loaded the pig on the sled as they went by and they saw their dad at the front door. So, but our, the point here is we are not to make Sabbath a drudgery, okay? During a portion of the day, the Sabbath, all should have an opportunity to be outdoors. How can children receive a more correct knowledge of God and their minds be better impressed than in spending a portion of their time out of doors, 
not in play, but in the company of parents. Let the young minds be associated with God in the beautiful scenery of nature. Let their attention be called to the tokens of his love, uh, uh, tokens of his love to man in his created works, and they will be attracted and interested. You can direct their minds to the lovely birds making their, mu their air musical with happy songs, and gloriously tinted flowers in their perfection perfuming the air. All these proclaim the love and skill of the heavenly artist and show forth the glory of God. Now having said that, there is a job for the Holy Spirit that is not our spot, our job. And I would emphasize we do not need Sabbath police. Let the Holy Spirit do his work. And today I'm hoping that this comparison between the Boundary Waters Wilderness Park and the Sabbath as a park in time has given you a fresh look at the purposes behind the scenes of the Sabbath. Clearly, we have only scratched the surface of the principles of the Sabbath today. For each of these points deserves a full study in and of itself. It is desired, it is my hope, that this comparison today may encourage us each to examine our own principles of Sabbath observance. And just as you will never understand the Boundary Wilderness Park until you have experienced it, when it comes to the Sabbath, the park in time, you will never fully understand it until you experience it. Psalms 34, verse 8. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. I invite you to turn in your hymnals to number 487 in the garden. And as we sing this song. Think of the garden in terms of the